Okay, good evening and welcome to the April 27th, 2022 meeting of the Needham Board of Health. I'm Rob Partridge, Chair. This open meeting of the Board of Health is being conducted in person and remotely per the Governor's Executive Order of 31220 and is amended on June 15th, 2021 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Materials for this meeting have been circulated previously and are available on the town website. This meeting is being recorded. I will introduce each board member. Please respond by saying yes when your name is called. Kathleen Brown? Yes. Steve Epstein? Yes. Tejal Gandhi? Yes. And we are still waiting for Ed Cosgrove. Uh, but we'll get started. Um, and I guess the first thing I'd like to do is to welcome Dr. Gandhi to our board. Um, and uh, we're delighted to have you uh, as part of our board. And I thought it might be good to have you briefly introduce yourself, because although you can't see them, there's lots of staff uh, that you'll be working with uh, on the call. And I guess maybe we could also all, all introduce ourselves and maybe turn cameras on so she can see that. Anyway, I'll let you start. Let me start. Okay. Well, it's uh, great to be here, and hopefully I'll meet many of you in person uh, over time. So I'm Tejal Gandhi, and um, an internal medicine doctor by background, and uh, started out my career at Brigham and Women's, and spent about 15 years there doing primary care, and then sort of transitioned more to work in the area of quality and safety. And so I was the director of safety at the Brigham for about a decade, and then the chief quality and safety officer for Partners Healthcare. So um, long history in thinking about uh, quality and safety, but also with primary care background, really thinking about prevention and uh, engaging with the community and, and other aspects like that. And then oh, since then, I actually left Partners to run a nonprofit that was um, the National Patient Safety Foundation, which eventually merged with a bigger nonprofit. And then now I'm uh, at a company called Prescani, where I do quality and safety work for healthcare systems around the country. And one of the areas that I've been focusing a lot on, in addition to sort of the safety uh, space has been uh, equity and working with a large number of health systems around the country to help them really advance their efforts on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's another area um, of uh, strong interest. And then the last area is I did start out my career as a researcher. And so I love data um, and analytics and help really trying to think about how are we measuring quality and uh, you know, how are we working to improve it and can we measure those improvements? So anyway, that's a little bit about me. I've lived in Needham for, I have to do the math, since 2004, so you guys can do the math. Um, <laughs> since 2004, so a long time, and I've uh, I'm with my husband and two kids, one of whom my son is at Needham High and my daughter is just finishing up at Pollard. Okay. Great, well, welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'll just start with the names. I'm uh, Rob Partridge, an emergency medicine uh, physician uh, by training, still practicing, uh, strong interests in public health and global health. Uh, lived in Needham since 07. Uh, this is I'm just about to start my fourth year on the board, and I've got a couple more hours of this chair. <laughs> uh, Kathleen Brown with Matt with Tuck and Fun. Um, I'm an environmental health consultant and background in air pollution, biostatistics, um, and lots of COVID work the last few years, kind of, kind of changes through time, lots of different environmental topics. Um, I This is my second term, and I was chair for the beginning of the pandemic, and thank you, Rob, for coming <laughs> up. So, um, so I guess I'll go. Steve Epstein. Uh, I'm also an emergency physician. Um, I do an awful lot with organized medicine, particularly at the AMA and with ASEP and, and Tejal. We'll have a lot to talk about because I actually started the largest emergency medicine QCDR and you know what that means. Um, so I've been involved in the quality sphere for a little while myself. Uh, we're actually starting an emergency medicine data institute right now. So uh, like you, uh, we're dealing with a lot of data and analytics. Uh, I've lived in Needham for almost 22 years now, uh, raised two kids here who are now in college, 
Um, you know, still have a, a keen interest in, in all the public health types of work we do. I've been championing, you know, some of the concussion work and head injury because we see a lot of that in the emergency department and trying to make this a, a healthier and, uh, and happier community for all of us. Oh, sure. Um, I'm Tiffany Zeich. I have worked in Needham almost five years now. I've lived in Massachusetts for only six. Uh, moved out here for my master's program at BU for public health. Uh, started as full-time public health nurse and then uh, was promoted to assistant director of public health a year and a half ago. Uh, public health is my passion. It's awesome. I love it. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> And I'm Tim McDonald, I'm the Director of Health and Human Services. I've uh, been in Needham for almost eight years now, uh, first as the Director of Public Health and now as the Health and Human Service Director. Uh, we have a, a very good team. You're going to get the staff reports at the end of the meeting, but we have a, a very good team, a lot of full-time and part-time staff, a lot of different grant programs, um, and we're sort of uh, moving out of COVID but still have some work in COVID that's going on uh, and sort of returning to a lot of our day-to-day -day activities, which is sort of great and exciting getting into more of our public health promotion um, and prevention activities. So I did start to promote, uh, Mr. Chair, some of the staff members to just have an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, okay, that sounds good. And, and if we can do that now, or they can also do it when they present. So we can, uh, if, you, if you want to do it now briefly, we could certainly yeah, do, it do it now another. briefly and then. Sorry, do you mind starting? Sure. Uh, my name is Tara Gurge, um, Assistant Director of Environmental and Community Health. Um, I started back in Needham in 2000 as a health agent and then kind of worked my, up, my way up to Assistant Director, I think back in 2017, I want to say. And um, yeah, I enjoyed work in public health. I got a master's degree in public health and I've enjoyed working for the town of Needham. I live in Franklin so um, and I commute from there. So welcome. <laughs> Do you mind introducing yourself next? Sure. Hi, I'm Lynn Schof. And um, I, did you say Lynn? Did you uh, say that's okay. Sure, go ahead. Oh, oh, sorry. Anyway, I am Lynn Schof. Um, and <laughs> I joined Needham about six years ago after retiring from Cambridge Health Alliance and Cambridge Public Health Department. Um, I've done almost everything in public health except for inspections. And uh, currently I am the team leader for our um, accreditation team. I also do a lot of writing, grant writing, and just play with ideas. Uh, Allie, do you mind introducing yourself briefly? Sure. Hello, I'm Allie Littlefield. I've been with Needham since June. I was an intern um, part time. And three weeks ago, I started a full time position as the environmental health agent. Thank you. Um, Michael. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Lethen. I started with Needham as the emergency management administrator in August of 2020. Uh, before that, I was a full-time emergency manager in the Massachusetts Air National Guard, and I also did some work uh, with the Boston Public Health Commission in their uh, Office of Preparedness, uh, working with emergency dispensing sites and stuff like that. Thank you. Um, Diana? I'm Diana Acosta. I am the former environmental health agent. Um, I started in Needham back in 2017, and I have to pull up my title because it's very long now. So shared public health services grant program manager. Uh, when we go over staff reports, I'll explain a little bit more, but basically I'm in charge of the two shared services grant that we have from the state that are, we're trying to form a coalition between Needham, Dover, and Medfield. Thank you. Karen? Good evening, everyone. Glad to see you. My name is Karen Shannon. I joined the department um, just about six and a half years ago, initially as a part-time project coordinator for the Drug-Free Communities Grant. 
Um, and since that time, I have become full time. I'm a senior substance use prevention coordinator. So my focus is on youth substance use prevention. And I oversee um, several grants, one of which is a federal grant for um, underage access to alcohol. And um, I also oversee our community coalition, which is the Substance Prevention Alliance of Needham, made up of volunteers in the community and stakeholders, again, towards the mission of reducing and preventing youth substance use. Great, thank you. Uh, Rebecca, do you mind Hi, um, Rebecca Hall. I joined back in the beginning of March. I'm the Traveling Meals Coordinator, um, basically coordinating volunteers to get um, meals from that are prepared at Beth Israel Hospital out to our homebound residents, um, residents that can't get to you know a store or whatever to get meals prepared for themselves. Um, just getting out there, doing some good for our community and taking care of our own. Glad to be here. Um, I think Carol and Elisa, we can do you and then we'll jump back to the agenda. Uh, I can go first or? Yes, go ahead, Carol. Me? Hi, my name is Carol Reed. I have worked in the Needham Public Health Department since 2008. I started uh, as a part-time uh, community educator um, to work across all ages after um, the incidents of youth and young adult uh, loss by suicide. Um, we filed a federal grant and since 2009, I have been working managing uh, underage substance use prevention grants. For the past seven years, I manage uh, federal dollar substance abuse block grant to Mass Department of Public Health. Needham is the lead agency with the public health departments of Dedham, Walpole, and Westwood. Uh, I worked formally in addictions at NORCAP in Norwood. I'm also a licensed Massachusetts school counselor. And I live in Medfield. I've been there for 30 years and I'm a Medfield Board of Health member. So uh, you'll always hear me appreciate Tim and Tiffany uh, taking on the uh, shared services grants to help our community. And now Diana, so thank you. Then, hi everyone, I'm Elisa. Um, I'm working with Carol on the Mass Call 3 grant for the four towns of Needham, Dedham, Walpole, and Westwood. I've only been here since December. Um, I'm about to graduate with my master's from BU in public health which is exciting. Um, so yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I think we have Mary, uh, one more to introduce. Hi, I'm Mary Fontaine. I'm one of the public health nurses working with Tiffany. I started in October of 2020 doing primarily COVID follow-up. And I would like to say that COVID is letting me do all sorts of other things now, but eh. Um, but I am working more with other infectious diseases, take home naloxone and other uh, nurse type activities, including vaccination and, and, and. <laughs> so uh, welcome. It's nice to meet the new board member. Thank you for letting us all chime in. Great, thank you. Thank you everybody. Uh, and Ed Costco uh, is not here. So I'm mean, just quickly doing introductions. Yeah, sorry, I'm afraid. Yeah. Dr. Tejal Gandhi, who I don't know if you know. You know? We've spoken on the phone. We've spoken on the phone. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Okay. Um, we, we've got you through everybody who would like to introduce themselves. Yep. Okay, great. There was a few more. <laughs> <laughs> we'll meet them as time goes on. Um, okay. So, uh, first on our uh, agenda this evening is the minutes uh, from March 29th. I move that we accept the minutes. Yeah, I'll second. Okay. Uh, there's a motion and a second to accept uh, the minutes uh, as recorded. Uh, all in favor by voice vote say aye. Kathleen? Aye. Ed? Aye. Steve? Aye. Uh, Rob is aye. And I guess 
Tejal would be an abstention if she wasn't here. Okay. Uh, that done. Next is uh, follow up from the Weisbaum Farm hearing from two days ago. Sure, Mr. Chair. If I could, um, we do have uh, scheduled to start at six twenty-five. The the first part of the hearing uh, about marijuana treatment centers, um, the amended regulation, the proposed amendment to the regulation. Um, the um, the sort of the subject of the regulation, uh, the only medical marijuana treatment center in Needham, Sierra Naturals has requested that the board consider extending the hearing beyond April to its May meeting uh, so that Sierra would have some time to provide testimony and have uh, some people attend in person. Um, they indicated that there were some conflicts. Um, so I, I said I would bring that to the board's attention. Um, we did notice this hearing, so it does have to start today, um, but it's certainly within the board's rights to extend the hearing uh, so they can take in more information and public comment if it wants. Um, I believe we should technically open the hearing now that it's 625. Um, okay, um, so I will officially open the hearing uh, for the proposed re revisions to Article 20. Um, and we can either discuss those things now and hold the meeting open until, or hold the hearing open until next month, uh, or we can open the hearing now and just carry on with our regular agenda. So it's entirely at the, the board's discretion. The staff can talk about the proposed changes um, if you want. I do know that um, Bob Smart uh, is one of the lawyers who's representing Sierra, and he did come in person. Um, and I do know that we have one or two folks listening um, who are not staff members who may be interested in giving public comment. Okay, so why don't we do that? We'll jump forward and discuss the proposed revisions. Uh, and then we'll go back to the West Bank. So we will, yeah, we will be here. So you're welcome to come. Okay. Tara, do you mind, um, Tara or Tiffany, do you mind setting the table and sort of the process that the staff went through, uh, taking input, doing research? Um, yeah, yeah, Tiffany, you can go ahead. Okay, so. Um, so we received a letter, I believe, in September last year from Sierra. Then they came and spoke to the board, I want to say October, sometime around there, um, about the changes they would like to see. Some that more align with the Cannabis Control Commission and what their current rec recommendations and regulations are comparative to what NEDEMS have been since um, we put them into place. So the board went, or the staff went through, um, we talked about what the the requests were from CIRA. The board looked at the regulations we have. Um, some of the requests from CIRA included things such as um, discount programs, um, revised to 20.6 to allow coupons and discounts, sales and promotional gifts. Um, request two was amend 20.6.10 to allow logo CIRA on promotional items, changes policy and requiring approval of edible packaging before allowing sales. And request number four is to discontinue the requirement to submit PORI reports to the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, so the staff members worked with the board on questions, what we'd like to see, what we wouldn't like to see, getting clarification on what those are. Um, what it came down to is with request number one, the Board of Health wishes to continue disallowing discounts beyond the prices for low income individuals. Um, on request number two, the Board of Health um will maintain the ccc regulations um and to see limit limits exist for restrictions on the use of logo on promotional items um need them can be stricter than the state so at this current moment in time we have put that into our current uh, the adjustment of the current regulations uh, for request number three board health decision wishes to continue policy um uh, review of the packaging for non-edible products um, with that as well. So we would like to continue to review the packaging on both edible and non-edible products. Um, and then request number four was um, the, the quarry reports and uh, the board is okay not submitting the quarry reports to us upon when they're run, but should have, Sarah should have them on hand or any business should have them on hand. So if they're requested by the board or 
the staff members, we can see those. Yeah, yeah. And I know that the staff did quite a lot of work translating um, the regulation from when it was drafted, when it was the Medical Marijuana Treatment Program at the Mass Department of Public Health to the current Cannabis Control Commission. Uh, there's been quite a few updates to regulations as part of that. Yeah, we tried to align the regulations that we have with the numbers with the uh, CCC and we'll need to change the title as well to uh, marijuana treatment centers instead of medical marijuana. Um, so you'll see a lot of those changes within the new regulations. And uh, I don't think you mentioned the other one other thing was that we would uh, permit uh, posting of prices yes. inside yes. So, uh, yes. the treatment center. Yes, permit posting of prices inside. You can have them buy the actual product um, or continue a list, which is what the previous were. Um, but Needham itself, Needham as a town, has restrictions on posting signs on the windows and things like that. But the CCC and Needham will maintain the regulations that you cannot post products and prices on windows or outside of the establishment. So um, as Tiffany indicated, the um, staff worked with the feedback the board had given it um, on the discussion of the regulation in general, the updated Cannabis Control Commission regs, and the request from CIRA. And the red line version, which you can see it has quite a few red lines in it, is the product of the staff's work um, based on CIRA's request, the board's feedback, and uh, the Cannabis Control Commission regs. It is available for public comments. To date, we have not received any public comments. Um, one of the potential benefits that the board should choose to extend the hearing is that that would give um, CIRA, it would give members of the public more time to either submit a written comment or to attend the hearing in May to give uh, oral testimony. Okay. Um discussion about the regs as as marked on our packets. Yes. Exactly. So for, I only had one minor thing, which is uh, on, it's page 10 of the red line document, page 172 of our document. Uh, 20.5, 20.52H. Page 10 of the red line, Rob? Yes. Starting yeah. if the, if the infused product. So 20.5.2, 20 then where are we going? Or H, capital H. H, okay. It's also. It was page 172 of the packet. Yes. Um, so I'm not sure if this makes a difference, but I think instead of saying IE, um, which means that is, it should say EG, which means for example. So it means that the list there would be examples, but not a complete list. Um, and that is might include, might be, a, might be considered a complete list or interpreted as a complete list. The other IE should change too. Uh, yes. I don't know what else you can do. Yes. Just it's just that one that caught my eyes. I used to EG. Um, do we have uh, questions or comments for the board no. from uh, any of the participants or guests? Yes. Uh, uh, I'm attorney Robert Smart. I live in town. I, I was um, just going to think if, if you yeah, can sorry. say um, the street address, just because we, I know you recorded it on the thing. Okay. Uh, Robert see. Smart, uh, 25 Mayo Avenue. Uh, I've lived in town since 1980. I was in the planning board for 10 years. and um, been a town meeting member for about 30, I'm starting up again on Monday. Uh, I, I was recently asked by CIRA uh, Naturalist to represent them. They have a primary counsel, John Fernandez, who couldn't be here uh, this evening. Um, and I'm here to request that uh, formally that the hearing be kept open 
continued to your next meeting uh, so that we have some time to go over the red lines, uh, perhaps provide our own proposed red lines, um, uh, line up uh, uh, some witnesses, um, provide some documentary evidence um, to you for that next hearing. We didn't hear about um, this, didn't know about this hearing until Friday, uh, the 22nd. So we just haven't had time to pull everything together. So I'm requesting that we you keep this open till the next uh, meeting. I do have a formal uh, letter I'm requesting, I'm requesting that, that the matter be continued. And the board has in the past, uh, especially when there has been public interest, has had more than one month of hearings. So it, it's certainly in the board's discretion if it would like to continue to get additional public comment. The matter was noticed. Um, I will own, we usually make an effort when there's sort of one, not target, but only one entity regulated by the regulation to reach out to them. And I wasn't able to make contact with my contact from Sierra until Friday. Um, it was posted according to all the requirements of two weeks in advance in newspaper circulation. Um, but I do think that it would afford us more time to publicize the materials and get additional public comment if the board was willing to extend it. I mean, I'm okay with that. I don't see that uh, there's any rush to get this done. And you know, I'd certainly like to hear what uh, people have to say and give us the opportunity to respond to that. So I have no problem with that. Do we need a formal motion for that or not? You, you would, yeah. Um, the very, very good. I'll move that we continue the hearing until the next meeting of the Board of Health in May. I'll second that motion. Okay. Um, and we'll have a voice vote. Um, Tejal Gandhi? Yes. Kathleen Brown? Yes. Ed Cosgrove? Yes. Steve Epstein? Yes. And Rob Marchand is yes. Extend the hearing until next month meeting. Right. If I could ask, but do, do you have a date for that meeting? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You could just keep coming down here, I suppose. <laughs> so um, the two times that worked for the most people were uh, May 19th uh, from 6 to 8 p.m., which worked for everybody but Steve, and May 24th from 6 to 8 p.m., which worked for everyone but Tasha. Was it the second week? Uh, the 24th. So we could certainly, I don't know if there's any flexibility uh, from the board members on those dates. We could also circulate additional dates to try to figure out if there's one where all five members are available. Uh, June was even worse to try to find a date. <laughs> I think I could do the 24th, actually. Um, that would certainly be great. It would be the easiest meeting we've scheduled in a long time then. <laughs> do we have a time? Six to eight was the time that I had put in the doodle poll, and I think four of the members had said they were available. Um, if that works for everyone, that would be certainly easy to make sure we make group reservations and the like. Okay. 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 So May 24th, six to eight. Yeah. That's great. Well, that's easy. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Yeah. <laughs> great. Okay. So. All right, for the moment then, I think there is no further discussion that we need to have on the proposed All right, thank you very much. Thank okay. you, well, appreciate Thank it. you. Uh, so we'll go back to uh, our emergency hearing on Rice Bar and Restaurant. To discussion of compliance issues. Timeline. What provisions we would have in place? Inspection. And right. So as the follow-up. So um, Tara followed up on uh, Tuesday morning or Tuesday afternoon with a, an official sort of order letter encapsulating the board's decision to sustain the suspension. So the suspension remains in effect. Um, the board has, as its discretion, you know. Um, a range of options. Um, there is the option, uh, and I know that Tara, maybe you and the public health staff want to speak about it, um, to say that because of a series of 
um, violations and sort of a consistent pattern of not correcting violations? Uh, is it appropriate for uh, this owner and this management team to operate a restaurant and need them at all? That would certainly be a um, substantial step. Uh, that would be permanently revoking someone's ability to operate a type of business in the community. Um, but I know that the staff feel pretty strongly that they have worked quite hard to get compliance and, and have hundreds of pages showing the lack of success of trying to get compliance. Um, this is certainly a different situation than we had with Hungry Coyote. This isn't sort of defiance. As you heard from, from Charles, he sort of acknowledged the, the challenges and um, you know, pledged to continue to trying to work at them. And I don't think anyone doubts um, that he is you know, sincere in that. I think the challenge from the staff and Tara, you can at any point, was that we don't believe the, we believe there's been ample demonstration that the follow through doesn't happen. Can, can I ask a question? Is, is the management team at all new? It sounded like there had been some new hires. So I'm just curious, like over the, when were some of these uh, newer people brought in? Tara, you might have to remind me. I know Jackie's been in place for a while. Manny is, is re, has returned, I believe. Uh, he had been manager for previous occasions, but had been gone for at least a couple months. Is that right? Right. Yeah. And Andy is new, brand new. He's the newest employee. That was the recent one that was um, certified. And yeah, so we, we do have some new employees here. Um, but that has been the challenge, I think, since... Um, a couple of years ago when we had the same issue happen before with him not being able to sustain full-time trained staff. And so when Manuel left, this happened before back in 2019-ish or 18-ish, he you know, kept the restaurant going really well. Um, he left. We saw the restaurant go back downhill. We questioned Charles. He said, oh, Manuel left. I said, well, Manuel shouldn't be running your restaurant. You have to run your restaurant. You're the person in charge. You're the owner. And so this has been our struggle is that if he gets a good employee, like now he has Jackie that's been trained and she's well-versed in food safety, but what if she leaves, you know, and this is what's been happening. It's been hard to sustain manage a management uh, team that can oversee trained staff. Yeah, like I, I could, that was a point I raised the other night. I mean, it's how many hours in the day, how many, like how many shifts can they cover um, with enough trained people? I mean, they don't, do they have even the bare minimum right now? With this just are two trained people on staff on site at all times, right? And he only has four. Yeah. Um, four. Four people trained, is that right? Four Sarah? trained. Correct, yeah. 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 Um, so, and, and again, sort of blaming the, the staff for leadership problems. And I don't want to close restaurants, but if there is a leadership problem here, you, you know, you can't just blame the person in the kitchen when they're in charge. It, it comes back to you. Um, I don't know. If you know I'd like to. Talk. <laughs> I'd like to add too that Maureen Lee, I was hoping she, was, she would open up more about that fact because I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her on the phone when this first, uh, when we were extending the permit and he begged us to have additional people trained, which we've allowed him before, extend, 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 make sure you get everything in line. She told me one-on-one -on -one that she does feel that Charles it has that authority, um, managerial experience necessary to maintain a food establishment in a safe and sanitary condition. And I, I said, can you put that in writing for me, <laughs> Maureen? And I said, this is huge because you've trained him now. You've done this before for 12 months back in 2018, 19. You've done it again, and you're still seeing the same patterns. And so she said to me offhand, if it wasn't for Jackie, the new woman that you met the other night online, this place would not be afloat that it would be back to you know where it is so this is what we're depending on his staff one of the things that the board had talked about uh in january with the hungry coyote hearings was uh involving the board at an earlier stage um as i think the board remembers we had at that time um three restaurants that the public health division had uh 
work to establish an MOU with where they outline the conditions that were needed to keep operating to, to have a renewal of a permit. Um, Rice Barn was one of those restaurants. So I think um, we would have liked to have implemented the new process, but this was sort of already started under our old process where we had uh, public health professional staff work with the restaurant, not necessarily bring them in for a full hearing. One of the things that we did hear from the board was they want to have more of a public process, more of public engagement potentially if there's progressive discipline uh, on a family restaurant, uh, on a struggling restaurant, I should say. Um, so I think that is still our goal. Um, this rice barn situation was begun before we sort of started that new idea. Um, I do have, you know, separate from rice barn, I do have some questions for the board about whether there are different ways they'd like us to um, handle things like this in the future. So in, in the monthly report, for example, there's a, a chart of violations that have been found um, during restaurant inspections in that month. It's there, it's easy to read. Would it be helpful that if we, we can set whatever bar is appropriate, but if there is a, you know, if there is serious violations, do you want to see the full report in that monthly packet rather than just the chart listing out there was a violation and we've, you know, worked with the restaurant to follow up? Would that be helpful? Um, and is there, right now, is our posture sufficient? Do you want, we, we pride ourselves and Tara works very hard with her team to provide training, to provide technical assistance, to do reinspection after reinspection, to try to get people to comply. Uh, and that's, that has generally served us well because we have restaurants that are um, well-intentioned and are trying to comply. I think we've seen two examples where that hasn't served as well. One is someone who was defiant and was unwilling to sort of follow the process in Hungry Coyote, and one in Rice Barn that was a full participant in the process, but still wasn't able to sort of follow through and, and enact the reforms needed. Um, so maybe one of the questions to the board is in the future, do we have to engage earlier in the process? Do we have to maybe have a quicker trigger for closing a restaurant, um, even if it's only you know, for two or three days, maybe that's something that we, we want to have, we want to change our sort of posture for how we work with them. I mean, with regard to a couple of your points, I think it would be helpful to have some details on like, at least the priority uh, violations and maybe priority foundations, the, one that's, the ones that need to be fixed quickly. Yes. Um, the core ones that I think are 90 days. Yeah. Uh, that wouldn't be as important, but I, I definitely I think more detail would help on those. Okay. Um, and you know, I, I think um, maybe have, instead of just closing earlier, which we could do, uh, perhaps have the owners or responsible managers come and come to our regular meeting and ex explain how they're going to improve things. Mm -hmm. maybe, have, maybe have to trigger that earlier so that there's an understanding of how serious we consider the violations, especially if repeated. And then, you know, before, hopefully that, will, that intervention would help so it doesn't carry on and end up like this. I, th I mean, I think that our uh, forbearance with this restaurant uh, maybe has exceeded uh, the uh, reasonable bounds, uh, and what Rob is saying is correct, but we should maybe have been brought, brought in sooner mm -hmm. uh, so that we could quote unquote invite the restaurant uh, owner managers to meet with us and they could under, they would begin to understand the seriousness with which we take uh, uh, violations that we, we found. Um, in order to protect the public health. And I think that um, we should, uh, it, I, I don't know if it should be necessarily a public hearing, but I think they should come to one of our meetings earlier earlier on uh, so that they, again, so that they just appreciate we're on top of this. You know, maybe they just brush it off, or in this case, it just seems to be one series of uh, mishaps after another. Uh, and I understand during the pandemic, we, everything was disrupted and 
it's been very hard to find staff, uh, qualified staff and so on, uh, on the part of a lot of restaurants. So yeah, I, I understand that, but I think maybe this one carried on a little too long. Would it lend any weight to have a, at least one or two board of health members come to an administrative hearing? Or, you know what I mean? Like it's waiting for a month for us to meet or some other, you know, see who can someone attend to the meeting if any member of the board. So it's something to suggest. Yeah, I think um, the process we've done in the past where, where the restaurant would come in for an administrative hearing with either sort of Tara or myself presiding for the hearing, I think has served us well in the past, but I think it would maybe convey a little bit more gravity if either it was like the chair or vice chair or it was uh, an invitation to come speak before the full board about their improvement plan. Um, I think that I hope we, we, we impressed upon them the seriousness anyway, but I think this might be a way to underscore that. Um, I mean, we certainly don't want to see uh, restaurants closing because we're being unreasonable. But I think we've gone beyond being reasonable in this case. Uh, I think that um, probably should have intervened so. Yes, and I think, well, so it, it partially is a question. We, we did intervene quite a bit. It's just our, our process is encouragement and training and technical assistance, encouragement yeah. and training and technical assistance. And it might be that, you know, but before you get to that second level. round of encouragement, yeah. you have to have some type of penalty. So. Yeah. Right, before you get to full closure, is there some intermediate that really lets people know that, okay, this is this is getting very serious. As a, you know, it seems like it's sort of, you know, a hand-holding to boom the close and maybe there's some middle step, which maybe is coming to this board, maybe it's, you know, something else we can think about, but it feels like there needs to be something that really escalates the gravity of the situation. I think if they had to come to the full board, it would escalate, it would certainly make it, it would escalate it to, to a point where they know, they definitely know that they're in trouble. Honestly, seeing those photos is all, I mean, it's kind of when you need it. it it's not all, it's months and months of that, but um, I mean, some places do grades, right? For, for yes. like in our city, it's a B or C or something, right? I don't want to I've only ever seen class. these and those are at dive bars. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't even know what they are, but yeah. I, know. yeah. I think that was also important to point out, and um, uh, Tara can correct me if I'm wrong, but our our current policy of, of support, encouragement, training for most cases is effective. Am I wrong about that? I think it's been very effective for 15 or 20 years. Um, I think we unfortunately are maybe finding the, the two examples of cases that don't, that that policy does not fit well. You know, Tara and her spent a lot of time on it. I think figuring out how we, so the state regulation provides um, the Board of Health or uh, the Board of Health designated agent the ability to emergency close a uh, restaurant for serious violations. Um, that can be challenged at a public hearing, which it was, and then it's up to the full board to convene and vote to either sustain, overturn, or modify. Uh, the state regulation affords the restaurant owner the ability to remedy the violations and then be subject to a reasonable reinspection. And if it's determined by the board or the designated agent that they have remedied all of the violations, their permit can be reinstated. Um, I think in this instance, the violations are so numerous and insignificant, it's hard for someone to fix that over a weekend. Um, but, you know, it's, it gets into your staffing, it gets into your training, it gets into the complicated issues that, that require weeks or maybe even longer to fix. I do think, you know, thinking about the restaurant industry, and I'm not an expert in restaurant financing, but a suspension of three months or something for a restaurant in need, I'm not a well-financed Boston restaurant, is the same thing as permanent revocation because they won't financially survive. No. Three weeks, maybe. Yeah. So I mean, I the sooner we can, if he's really complied, that that's 
I don't quickly can I mean the pest uh, control issues that doesn't seem like something that can get fixed very quickly, right? So I mean to get rid of that kind of infestation. I think one of our concerns and it was in the packet was that um, Charles stopped paying the pest company and they stopped coming um, until we sort of Tara and her team were like, hey, we we're missing a report. What's going on? Called the company. They said, they're not paying us. So we're not going up there. Um, we do have some concerns that they were, they're trying to figure out how to comply with spending the least amount of money and cutting back on pest control is never the answer to that question. Um, there are, there's baiting and trapping that would need to be done, but there's significant, um, you know, foundational improvements, not, not, not renovating the building, but you know, filling cracks, filling holes, uh, repairing you know parts of the walls of the floor um, that would take a little bit of time. Yeah. Tara, do you have any sense? Uh, and I don't know if Charles has followed up, but how far he's gotten on his list of what he thinks he needs to improve? He basically made it sound like during the hearing, as if you notice that he, we could go in there right now and do a follow-up inspection and see everything done. So. I don't know if that's something you want us to act on. Monica Pincari said she could go in there on Saturday and uh, witness what he's done. Um, and we'd have to schedule with him, obviously, because he's going to have to meet us there. But I was thinking we could let him know, like Friday night, that we're going to be coming in Saturday to do that reinspection. Um, if you, if you want us to go and forward and do that, but if we find the same violations, you know, we have a plan of action. What are we going to do? You know, moving forward with the situation, um, the the money thing, I agree, Tim. Like he 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 goes on these um, struggles once in a while. And we find out that he might drop his trash pickup, or he'll drop his pest control, and then we find a ramp up in complaints or ramp up in pests and trash issues, and then we we investigate it, and then we find out that he's not paying the trash bill or he's not he's cut the pest control. So we're always it seems like. All our inspectors, like Diana can and attest to this as well, and Monica, we're, we're constantly holding his hand throughout this whole entire process. And again, my fear is, is that we allow him, you know, he completes what he needs to do to, to, to again, get his permit back. And then we're not going to have um, any hand holding for a while. And it's going to happen just like it did in 2019. Um, that's my fear is that can we ever get over this hump where he is going to live up to that manager uh, status where he can maintain this restaurant you know moving forward so do we give him that chance to do that we felt like we've given him that chance multiple times you know and so it's it's draining on a lot of our staff at this point so i just want the board to realize that so you, know, I mean, yeah. well, you need you need to have a formal process for that right and and this is the start of it and we haven't gone through a formal process so you know as as much as as painful as it is you know we're sort of starting at square zero um so you know first off if you're doing a lot of hand holding i think it's very reasonable particularly under these sort of circumstances where we're going to create some sort of a process similar to what we've done with tobacco um that you know he should be paying for those reinspections you know if, you know, sure. as often as often as they are, right? Um, and there should be a process for you know serious versus minor violations, as, as Rob kind of pointed out. We need to know what those are. You know, serious violation. You know, we're going to come back at your expense in a week. If it's not fixed, we're shutting you down. You know, until it is fixed, the reinspection is going to cost you know X amount of dollars. You know, second violation within a year. You know, something that you know it goes up. You know, I'm not sure what that process should be, whether it's fines, which is probably a lot easier on the restaurants than being shut down. Um, you know, that that is like a death knell for them. And you know, obviously, I think we'd like to avoid that if we can. Um, I don't know that we're going to come up with a process here today. Um, but, um, you know, Tim, I don't know if you, Tara, and the rest of the staff might, you know, sort of bandy this idea about and perhaps come up with a draft that we can start looking at. Um, that will address, you know, both the needs of our staff, um, you know, so that we're compensated appropriately for the work that, that everybody's putting into this, uh, but also the needs of the communities so that, you know, we're not shutting down restaurants willy nilly and we have, you know, kind of a, a real orderly process by which we make sure that restaurants are in compliance. Can I just add that uh, we were charging reinspection fees, so it used to be 125 
and it went up to 150 I believe but he was charged a fee for our re-inspections when we were doing those frequent two-week reinspection so that was part of the process from before not sure if that was made clear um, in the packet yeah and we did make him pay for Maureen Lee services this time around in order to extend his permit so he is we are penalizing him in that sense and making him pay these reinspection fees pay these food consulting fees so we can see improvement that's our goal we want him to succeed and to show us progress Right, you know, but so. ultimately he's going to either realize that you know this is draining my restaurant so much that I cannot do this because it costs me too much to run my restaurant because I mean it's costing him a fortune to run it right because he's inefficient and needs all this additional help and he's paying for it right so either he can make a living doing that or he can't that's a financial decision for him to make but we just need to make sure that our department is made whole and that we have a you know a fair process in place that every you know that every restaurant's going to follow rice bar included and uh, we move forward from there. I agree, and I just want to say our staff has been amazing, and and I know that this has really been challenging. This is also been, it really started in September 2019, and then with the pandemic, so he, he has also faced real challenges over that time right we all have so i feel like you know let's proceed with the process same as as we did with hungry coyote let's get it you know if he can really meet he can do an inspection on saturday and get open again then i get I, that seems sufficient if it would meet a normal inspection um i do think maintaining the pest control will be really important and sort of is there a sustainment um like, I don't know what frequency these things happen. If he were to reopen, how quickly another inspection would happen that he would have to pay for. But, you know, I would want to do another one relatively soon because I'm just not confident in and, 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 and how long we issue the permit for. Right. You know, yeah. For the hundred thirty, I believe it was six months. Yes. Right. And so I, I would not be willing to extend the permit for six months. No, and I think it should, be made, should be made clear to him that if we come in there for, the, for another inspection, and find that these uh, problems have really arisen after they've been supposedly fixed, that uh, he's subject to shut down right then and there. And for a longer period of time. Yeah. yeah. So maybe it would be appropriate to ask Charles and sort of convey to him that, you know, do you, would you like to be reinspected on Saturday? We're going to, you know, be going over with a fine tooth comb and we have quite a long list. Are you sure you're going to be ready? Um, and give him, you know, some ability to say, yes, I'm ready, or actually I'd like a little bit more time to get my house in order. You know, I do think we want to, you do want to re-inspect him relatively quickly. I don't want to say no, that we need to, once he passes re-inspection, charge him for the, the more frequent inspections. I think that's part of our responsibility. Um, but. We do have, as Diana mentioned, the reinspections for renewing of permits. If you know, essentially, if, if your lack of organization has cost us extra time and effort to get you open, then we do charge. Um, we would want to convey to him, Tara and Diana and Ali, that we would be, you know, sort of putting him in sort of our highest category of attention for most frequent inspections if he does reopen. We can talk about the details, I guess, tomorrow if the board's uh, okay with us on the um, on the venue they've sort of laid out. Do we need to do any have another meeting? If if, if he meets what's in the in the order, he can reopen without this meeting again. We can, the, acting on the board's behalf, we can give him a permit to operate. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Should we talk about the length of that permit? I, th I think we should. Uh, just briefly, I know we do have guests here to, to talk to us about the Needham Housing Authority. Sure. Um, but, you know, what is a reasonable length of time, Tara, or Ali and Diana, in your opinion, if Charles did pass reinspection, what's the reasonable length of time for a for a permit? And how quickly would we reinspect? Would it be a month? Would it be within two weeks? Uh, what? So we month? have extended his permit. Let's see. So we did it from one month in January. And then we did it for two months, I think, through March, right? The end of that. So, I mean, I, I definitely don't want to go beyond three months. I think we need to do it shorter than that. 
um, and then do a reinspection a couple of weeks after we give him the permit just to see if he's again still making progress. We want to keep continually see progress and not write up any critical violations or priority or priority foundation violations because this is what we keep seeing. Typically, we would give a restaurant time off to correct these violations and we would go in and not see any violations. So it's just very interesting that we're still seeing these priority violations even after all this training. So I just want to give him that short time frame to prove to us that he's maintaining that. So, so we're making an assumption that he's going to pass reinspection, which again is, is a pretty big assumption. But what about a 45 day permit? And we don't necessarily tell him, but we know that we're going to go in on day 30 or thereabouts, depending on where that falls in the week, um, and see his progress. Um, does that seem reasonable? Yeah. And I, I, I was thinking a little sooner. Six even. weeks. Even sooner? Yeah. Okay. I just didn't really worried about his ability to maintain, but I'm okay with 30, but I was thinking it might even, Tara, I thought you were sort of saying maybe even shorter than that, but. So perhaps a 45 day extension and an inspection yeah, within right. two to four weeks or two to three weeks after. Okay. The initial. Yeah, certainly the, the board and then the health division would be within its rights if we did extend them and then we did inspection and found significant violations, priority or priority core violations, okay. we can suspend his permit again. Right then and there. Yeah. Okay. And then okay. what we've talked about with other um, sort of restaurants that have up and coming problems, I guess I would propose that we rely on our health agents to tell us when mm -hmm. it's time for the board to intervene with either inviting them to our meeting or, or going to a disciplinary. So yeah. one of the things we've been doing and, and um, it's helping with accreditation, but it's also helping sort of with standardizing uh, work and having sort of better continuity between when their staff uh, departures. We've been doing over the last couple of years, uh, a number of policies, you know, how to make sure you submit your time card, how to do your travel reimbursement, all the way up to sort of more complicated things. So I guess my proposal would be that uh, the environmental health staff will work with myself and with Lynn and we'll come up with sort of a revised policy for the board to consider um, and talk about in May and you know with the goal of sort of having it in place for July 1 or something. I think that's a good idea. I think that we, we need to have that made into a policy. Uh, I keep getting a your internet connection is unstable. It is on the town's Wi-Fi, which doesn't surprise me, but I do know, Mr. Chair, we had a couple items on the agenda, but we did also have some guests. Um, yeah, why don't we jump over those? And, yeah, uh, we'll come I mean, back. a motion to do that, or no, or no, we can okay. we can move on. Okay, we'll come back to the discussion. Yeah. You can move on to our seven o'clock item. Uh, for the guests here from the Even House Authority. Yes. Um, like you said any any available seat? All right. Uh, maybe I'll sit closer in here. I know the sometimes the, 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 the owl there likes you to be a little closer. <laughs> to her. So great. Thank you so much. So I am Reg Foster. I'm chair of the Indian Housing Authority for the time being. I've been a commissioner for about 12 years. Uh, this is Steve Merritt. He's our new interim executive director. You may have heard that Andy Medeiros is uh, taking a job about 40, an hour and a half closer to her house here. And Steve has joined us and you've been on the job two weeks, a little over two weeks. Over two weeks. So, um, so uh, you were actually the first uh, board or committee that's been formally introduced to Steve, I believe, at this point in time, right? Nice to meet you. Nice, nice to meet you. And nice to meet you. I've talked to you on the phone. We have, uh, our paths have all crossed over the years. Um, uh, Tara has given me a time budget of 15 minutes, which okay. is, uh, uh, so I'm going to attempt to do that. Um, I put you in for 20 because she's the bad cop and I'm the good cop. All right. <laughs> and I will um, try to um, at least do a flyby of everything I think we want to talk about tonight. Uh, I understand you have a full agenda. I'm happy to come back when things are a little less pressed here. Uh, you all got our presentation in the board, and I think we've got it up on the screen there for the virtual uh, audience, uh, the, uh, the story of the Modernization and Redevelopment Initiative started several years ago. Uh, really, it's been about 10 years that the Housing Authority has been kind of trying to come up with a plan. 
um, to address our increasingly aging facilities of which I understand you as a board run into from time to time. And um, uh, the, uh, what we did, and I'm, I didn't bring copies for everybody. And if you don't need one, I will take it back. And no, that one is not. In um, for a couple of years leading up to spring of 2019, uh, we did for the first time for the Housing Authority a complete inventory and assessment of all our bricks and mortar, about 115 buildings. And uh, we have 336 units in all. We have five developments. And uh, we went through every one of them and assessed their conditions. They range in, a, and that is what this first page is. And we can um, turn to the second page of the slide here. And, um, and uh, our oldest buildings are about 70 years old. They're in the High Rock neighborhood. There are 60 bungalows there that were built as World War II veterans housing in 1951 and are at or beyond their useful lifetime at this point in time. Those of us who've been here for a couple of decades know that in 2005 and 2008, we took 20 of those bungalows and tore them down and redeveloped them into duplexes and um, opened up by 2009 or so. That has been generally considered a pretty successful first initiative. And it had been the intention of the Housing Authority to continue to do that, except that it killed off all the staff and the volunteer commissioners at the time. And we had a complete turnover. Um, and that's about when I joined the board in 2009 or so. Um, and we've sort of been uh, building the momentum back from there. We've had some setbacks. Um, and this is actually our third attempt we're on. Uh, but what um, we discovered in this uh, 2019 plan, and I leave you with copies because anything and any, everything you ever want to know about not only uh, what we have to work with, condition of the buildings, what they need by repair for repairs, but also our vision for addressing uh, these aging facilities is in there. Um, our next most youngest buildings are about 40 years old. Um, that's in the Seabeds Way development and the Captain Robert Cook development. Um, those were built just after about 1981. And uh, we, uh, they need to be, uh, you know, gut renovated. They need a major modernization in all, you know, in all its different systems. Um, the exterior, the interiors, the uh, campus, the roadways, the parking lots, and so forth and so on. Um, the reason for that and for Linden Chambers, which was built uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, 152 units of senior housing, uh, very small um, studios. Um, the reason that they're all in tough shape in part is because we don't receive every year in subsidy the amount of money we need to really uh, keep up with the uh, capital investment that you should and ought to be doing as uh, a landlord, which is what we basically are. And so um, the conclusions in this report here was that we really needed to launch uh, a five to 10 year initiative, uh, which we did uh, in the mid, um, uh, you know, in mid summer last summer to basically take the remaining 296 units that we have, the bricks and mortar, the apartments basically, the housing units, and systematically go through them where we can update them and bring them to up to 21st century standards. Um, that's mainly the seabeds and cook facilities. We'll, we'll find the money to do that and, and make that happen. Uh, with Linda Chambers and with High Rock Estates, um, uh, it, 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 it's cheaper to tear them down and do them over again. And I should also say that um, you know, since 2004, uh, affordable housing plan, since that plan, it's been a top priority of, of uh, Needham to actually do a Linden Chambers redevelopment in, in the 2007 plan, and it will be in the 2022 plan that the housing working, uh, house, affordable housing working group is working on right now. Um, when I say substandard uh, by 21st century standards, uh, part of what I mean is the, uh, the studio apartments are about 400, 400 square, 20 square feet a piece. Uh, today, you don't build anything less than about 
525, 550 square feet, one bedroom apartment. So all of our folks have their homes in these very small facilities that have no storage space. They're not energy efficient. We have seniors living up on the second floor and no elevators. So that's you know an ongoing problem in both the Linden Chambers facility and also up at the Seabeds uh, Way facility. Uh, no storage. Um, I put down moisture and filtration just in case that you felt the chair might have a deaf ear as to what's been going on lately. Yes, we have those problems, but many, many, many other problems as well. And um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Again, detailed in this plan here. Um, in launching the um, modernization and uh, redevelopment initiative, we took a very key decision that had inherited from the former boards, the earlier boards, which is we are too small a housing authority. We do not have the staff to really tackle even one of these projects, uh, let alone all of them uh, over a five to 10 year period. So in the spring, about a year ago, we put out an RFP. We got three great proposals, um, two from the private sector and one from the Cambridge Housing Authority. And we went through a completely by the book chapter 30B uh, compliant evaluation process and um, Cambridge Housing Authority came out way in front. So we basically engaged them and we have a five-year agreement with them to be our development partner, um, our development consultant, and basically help uh, the Neiman Housing Authority get these various projects done. And we started work at mid last summer and um, the first set of initiatives that we're working on and really it's going after the low hanging fruit because everything needs work. So you wanna start where you think you're gonna be able to find the money and where the need is greatest. And that turned out to be um, uh, manifested in the form of, of some CPA funding proposals that you're probably aware of that are before town meeting for next uh, two, Monday, hopefully for approval. One of them is to do what's called repositioning um, that's a, a, a term that I've come to understand in sort of reader di digest form of taking the federal funding subsidy streams that we have been receiving since day one. In fact, it actually goes back to the original um, housing, public housing program that was enacted in 1937. And we've been, and, and, and has been providing us that the sub starvation subsidies here and you reposition all of our federally subsidized properties from the old funding stream to the new funding stream. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And that's what the Cambridge Housing Authority is helping us to do. And, um, and when you do that, um, and this is, affects the Seabeds Way, the Captain Robert Cook and the High Rock Homes properties. Those are our federally subsidized properties. Um, bottom line, again, 15 minute presentation level uh, detail, you can generate, we estimate right now, and we're finding that estimate, about a million dollars more per year of operating subsidy for those properties than we receive today by just representing it to these new funding streams. And um, we can also unlock about $20 million worth of capital improvement um, money that we can use to do the upgrades to Seabeds and Cook. Um, also, uh, you start to use for the High Rock Homes um, redevelopment, which is the most expensive thing that we're considering doing here. So one of the two articles, uh, article number 18 actually, is focused on one of the studies for the High Rock Homes area that need to be uh, done. It's called an existing conditions study where you, in order to submit the application to the federal government to get this money, you can, in fact, um, by hopefully uh, second quarter next year, be approved for these improved uh, additional funding streams. And then we use the money to fix things up. Um, so um, we're doing a study at the High Rock Homes. We're also at the High Rock Estates actually property. Those are the 60 bungalows, World War II housing. And we're also doing parallel studies with Seabeds and Cook, which uh, town council ruled that we're not eligible for CPA funding 
uh, due to a technicality uh, that only town councils can really understand. Um, but that's what it turned out. Originally, we went in for all three studies here. Fortunately, we have saved our developers fee from uh, when we did the High Rock Homes redevelopment back in 2005, 2008. So we do have resources internally that we can draw upon in order to do those other two studies. Um, the other uh, Warren article, um, article number 17 is about $1.4 million to do a real schematic design uh, pre and all the pre-development activities to have basically a shovel ready project about 15 months after knock on wood, we received approval from the uh, town meeting members. And uh, we then, then um, look, uh, take that um, shovel ready project or more shovel ready project and use it to complete the funding that we need, probably not for the whole redevelopment because that's about a $115 million project. But we will also look in, the, in this uh, next phase at how can we phase it in, which is probably a, a better thing to do. You know, we've got to recognize um, all those people have, there are 152 individuals or uh, families that have their homes at the, here. And you can't just sort of blow up everything and redo it at the same time. It's too much for the neighborhood. We've got an elementary school across the street or a middle school across the street. Um, and so phasing. So, um, in the, your packet here is um, <coughs> our first look at the timing of how all these projects will be um, uh, sequenced and rolled out. Uh, this is going to up, up, be updated on a rolling basis, and part of it's going to be uh, dependent on how successful we are in finding the funding, the construction funding to do these projects. Uh, there's a very clear path to construction funding for doing the federal projects, the federally subsidized development projects. So that's the renovations of Seabeds and Cook and the redevelopment of the High Rock Homes. Our state subsidized uh, property is the Linden Chambers property. Um, and there's a, a statewide lack of capital funding for doing this sort of thing. In fact, uh, you know, there are 200 other um, local housing authorities that are in uh, the same condition we are in or worse, where they really need to do uh, a redevelopment. The good news is uh, Representative Garlick uh, has already um, uh, been working very hard for us and got a earmark of $1.25 million for the Loon Chambers redevelopment in the ARPA bill that was passed last December. And then about a year or 14 months ago, there was the economic development bill. And there was another earmark in there for $1.75 million for Linden Chamber. So we can see, again, back of the envelope lies, um, we can see a, a path towards funding uh, a phase one Linden Chambers redevelopment, which would probably involve the, um, if you have your geography in your head, uh, towards Oak Street, the north, uh, north side of the property where the, the low rise single uh, buildings, each one of it, which has four units. Uh, you could probably take down six of those buildings, 24 units, um, and, um, and in the same footprint, build something that really fits in the neighborhood well and is really attractive, but is more like 40 or 50 or 60 units to replace it. And then you can use that as swing space to start doing you know, phase two and phase three of Linden Chambers. So how am I doing on time? That's, that's my speed talking way of getting through the whole thing that I spend an hour talking about. I put um, Cambridge Housing Authority's qualifications in at the end here. Um, the, the wonderful thing about them is they just finished doing this in Cambridge, about 2000 units in the last 10 years, exactly the same sort of thing we're doing. Um, and um, they also chose to do it in house. So they have a 25 person planning and development department, which in essence we're renting or we're outsourcing. And, and a, they provided us a project manager and a, an overseer uh, who happens to be uh, a principal whose uh, name is Margaret Moran, who was one of the leaders uh, in doing the High Rock 
multiple uh, states, High Rock Homes redevelopment in 2005 and 2009. So she, she really knows the town extremely well. We also were very fortunate to have Steve join us. Um, uh, when Angie announced her retirement, we were a bit concerned because we do need leadership. Um, I'm again going to briefly introduce you, but you can ask you more questions. Steve is actually lives in Needham. Um, he actually wasn't a commissioner. He got his start in uh, affordable housing as a commissioner of the Needham Housing Authority in the early to mid 80s. Yeah, yeah, for five years, and then went on to have a very distinguished career. Um, uh, most recently, uh, 17 years, I believe, is the uh, executive director of Norwood Housing Authority and has done all this sort of stuff as well. So even though he's just here holding the fort uh, for us, and I, I have promised him I'm not going to try to recruit him out of retirement or anything like that, but he um, brings an enormous amount of experience from that, uh, those vantage points, as well as being uh, uh, you know, very involved in Massachusetts, NARO, the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials, uh, New England NARO, um, and also National NARO. So he's uh, he's uh, very familiar and experienced with all this sort of stuff. So questions? I would just add one yeah. thing. I, the first 16 years of my career, I was at the Cambridge Housing Authority. And that's right. I always leave that out. Don't I? Yeah. yeah. So working out with people, a few people that have Still there. Of course, when you when you said that at the finance committee a couple weeks ago, I said, "What Cambridge Housing Authority taking over Needham now?" Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, the finance committee is likely to support the two. Absolutely, articles. they uh, met so last Wednesday um, and uh, gave us a very tough grilling, and as they always do, everybody, um, Jim led by Jim Healy, and uh, we apparently passed with flying colors because if you look at the town meeting website you'll see the finance committee video recommendation, which is being by, given by Jim here. Healy and is, is a total 100% endorsement of what we're doing. That's great. I'm a big fan of those, I was environmental planner in the city of Cambridge um, community development ah, in my beginnings. Um, so, I, I, and how obviously affordable housing, as the expert on this stuff, I think this is, you know, a huge issue for our community. You drive by it, the most beautiful school you've ever seen, and then you go a mile down the street. Um, this needs work and should be a top priority. Um, I do want to talk about the moisture in the housing at some point, but if I do, I'll go quick because we used to be behind, so we can bring it up if you want to talk about Well, questions about um, I had this program here, a couple of questions. That I had, I have actually, I'm going to give this back to you because I have a copy of it, but I had um, seen that there's a plan in, in part of this for a home development or building between the Captain Cook and the Seabeds. Yes, project. that's on page uh, 83, yes, I believe. It's right up there. It's scary right. if I got that right out of uh, the top of my it's head. A little no, it's not. further back. It's no, a, I just had, it's not far, much, not much further back, but. Yes. Uh, it's on the 75. I Thank you. It All right, 75. There um, it is, yep. And then there's another proposal, I thought, originally for um, down by Chambers Street. Yeah, the Linden Chambers redevelopment. Right. That's right. Um, but I thought that after that, that that building was going to go in first. And then the people from the, from the uh, Linden Street uh, project would be probably recent. Moved, moved into that. And then the plan that I read called for essentially selling off the land where the Linden Street project is. Or that was one of the options that was considered, but it's probably that's not going to okay. happen. Okay. That was just an option. Uh, they, they explored all the different options. Um, there are two, for Linden Chambers, there's basically two conceptual studies that have been done. One that was done in this one, which said, what if we uh, uh, redeveloped it up the hill near High Rock our Street? Um, and, um, and the other one that we did in 2013, um, it actually said, no, let's redevelop on a phased basis using the existing site footprint. Um, and of the two, the 2013 one 
looks more realistic to do. That's but what I thought the original, that's what I had in my yeah. mind. And that's, and I saw that. And that's exactly what this, uh, when we uh, hopefully win the uh, CPA funding, um, yeah, the very smart architects and engineers will be looking at what in reality can be done. What is the zoning that needs to be changed? You know, utilities, there's con con issues, there's uh, geotech boring, and tenant relocation is a huge thing. So what is the strategy for tenant relocation? Another huge thing is if you're gonna do it in phases, how do you do that? Because you have to work it all out in order to just do phase one. Right. Okay. The other building um, is not really being discussed this year, the one up in Seabeds and Cook. And that the they were basically saying here, just conceptually, um, there's room to fit a 61 unit, two or three story building in between um, the two developments there. Um, and right now we're just doing site surveys and trying okay. to confirm what I that's I, I drove around up yeah. there and I looked at that spot. And it looks like it would be tight, but you could- Yeah, right really where the there. berm is between right. the two, um, two, the two sets of buildings there, that's right. I think my question is probably a little bit similar to that, and I'm certainly not an expert, but I know that the Boston uh, Housing Authority has been doing redevelopment of like uh, one of their major projects in Charlestown, and the way they're financing it from my layman's perspective is that they're essentially selling it to a developer who's going to redevelop all of the housing units and then build as a first step and then build a very significant number of units, essentially 100% or 150% of the uh, affordable housing units they build in the same location. <coughs> Did the Housing Authority consider any of that, trying to sort of... Well, so we'll be getting into that, but I, I, I can answer your question, I think, if I, if I understand it in another way. There, you know, again, oversimplifying. There are two different sort of models. You can, there's a model where you turn it over to the private sector and they take it forward. So when I did this in Marion, which I did um, in the aughts, you know, I took 16 units on 10 acres of senior housing and redeveloped it into 48 units. Marion, Massachusetts is 10% of the size that we are. And um, there is no capacity to do anything. And the, you know, maintenance was, there was no need of housing authority. If your toilet got plugged up, you call DPW and make him on the, over with a plunger. That, you know, that's the sort of thing. So we did take that model there. Um, and it was very, very successful. It could be extremely successful. Um, here, um, the sense of the board for years is that we want to be in charge of our own destiny. We, you know, we'll uh, use any kind of financial re uh, engineering magic that's available to us, and it's very complex out there with tax credits and a whole alphabet suit of a soup of funding opportunities here. But at the end of the day, the Needham Housing Authority is the appointed and the elected board that's responsible for affordable housing. In Needham, Cambridge Housing Authority also was uh, that was one of the things that won them the the, uh, the gig, so to speak, because they're very much into that. They're very they're unusual in that they did everything in house, and they really believed in that model. And we felt that they really understood what we wanted to do and knew how to get that done. Great. Right. Thank you. Another question for you, and I I, I know this isn't a Needham Housing property, but Stephen Palmer School. Yes. Um, yeah. I know that the lease is four to five years. We've been tracking it. And yes. uh, my understanding is, is that the current property manager, it's Crown and Shield, I think, mm -hmm. has to return that property vacant mm -hmm. to the town. And so the question I have is, then will her, of course, all, all those people that are in there are going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there was just a, a news item, was it Beverly, where they were in the process of doing something, mm -hmm. yes. and I don't think it's gone over very well. Mm -hmm. um, and what might be the plans for that site? Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea? So, other than you know, I've sort of made it my thing to track that sort of thing over the years. It's on the list, and the, you know, the future is is getting closer to have arrived, and it's time to start thinking about that. So, what we want to do is get the um, you know, first of all, tend to our own knitting. So we have 296 units that badly need to be updated and we need to take care of that. 
Uh, we already took a look at one opportunity, which is over on East Militia Heights Drive. You might have noticed that. Um, and and um, so we're, we're watching that. And we watch other properties as they come and go, like the whole Avery um, you know, re redevelopment. Of course, there's the whole Muzzy story last year and other things. So that's one of the things that's kind of on our watch list, mm -hmm. but I don't have an answer okay. where that goes from here. And it probably does need to be looked into. It might also be something that um, you asked the same question of the housing trust folks, um, because you know that we now share responsibility for this sort of thing with the housing trust. And of course, down down the end of the building, you know, Lee Newman and the planning department, I'm sure, has got that on their radar screen as well. Yeah. So, and then the other thing is. Uh, East Militia Heights is yes. that's a federal that's federal land, isn't it? It's owned by the army, yes. Yeah, so that would have to be sold to whoever. Yes, the town or and in that. fact, it it in the Defense Authorization Act of two thousand eighteen, it authorizes the army to sell this at fair market value and only fair market value, which is unusual. Usually, there's a you know, the whole process where if there's surplus federal property in a town, then they go through HUD HUD and and they can make it available to you for, for a, a good deal. But in this case, that was short-circuited by this special legislation in that 2018 bill. So um, uh, we, we put in a CPA funding uh, article uh, to buy the property. It has 12 three-bedroom family units that look a lot like what we have already in uh, the High Rock Estates area, but uh, development. But they're in better shape. They were used for military housing up until the end of 2019. They'd only need about a million bucks to fix the whole place up. And uh, the, uh, we got an appraisal uh, done. It's uh, appraised value is about 1.8 million bucks. Mm -hmm. So if you could spend 2.8 or 3 million bucks uh, for 12 units and you can do the, the, multi, the division here, you know, you can't build new units for that kind of money. Um, we ultimately uh, withdrew the uh, uh, proposal because the other entity that's had um, their eye on that property for years is Charles River Center, uh, an incredible program. I assume everybody knows what they're up yeah. in. Um, and it's right across the street from their six acre campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, went through a whole internal board process that I wasn't a part of, but declared their intention in early March of aggressively purchasing that property in order to do something with their program. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're you know, they're not our type of low income, deeply affordable housing, but the mission they do and the clients they serve are very much kissing cousins of ours. Sure. And we it does make two cents for two municipal entities to be bidding, you know, against, against each other. other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in, one other question in Cambridge and Boston, we have you know mixed income uh, yes. housing, you know, where it's market next to not market. Right. Is that something that's I mean, I had to briefly look through this report, but not either. So um that's always part of the strategy. Mm -hmm. Those are the things we're you know, we'll be especially with Linden Chambers, we will be getting deeply into. Mm -hmm. Um won't be an issue with seabeds and cook with the modernization. Um we have to keep at least 152 units the replacement units as deeply affordable the way they are right now, um, you can then have mixed income or, you know, it, it, uh, meaning um, people who uh, make 60% uh, or 80% of the um, uh, area median income. Um, um, but um, the board is consistently, as long as I've been a part of it, says, you know, our, our mission is really that deeply affordable housing area. Surely we have a housing crisis and for every, you know, there's no affordable housing in need of for anybody, no money, matter how much money you make, you know, but this is, a, this is our area here. Um, uh, we may have to have higher income levels in order to make financial numbers work, but if we don't have to, it's the sense of the board right now, you know, in theory that we'd like to, Make, make it such that, um, you know, as long as you make less than 50% of the area median income, you can, you know, apply for housing with us. And, you know, two thirds, most of our 
tenants are you know at the 30 percent level uh, or less they're living off of social security and, you know off of 12 15 20 thousand dollars a year and they don't have a lot of make ends meet and we we're the ones that provide them homes so but speaking as a native native and longtime houser that's even Palmer would look That'd be an interesting project to look at the next income mm -hmm. facility yep. there, mm -hmm. particularly for an older um, crowd. Per perfect location. Perfect yeah. location. So, yeah. Yeah, one of the things we hadn't you know, got around we to. Hadn't about yeah, that. We haven't talked about that yet there. You got my juice. He's, 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 uh, he's, <laughs> he's, uh, he's been uh, sipping from the fire hose the last couple of weeks, <laughs> overlapping with, uh, you know, with Angie Medeiros. We, you know, we have to make sure that we don't lose sight of mission number one. Uh, which I sense you want to ask us about a little bit in a moment, uh, which is we need to be, you know, with the financial resources we have available, as a good and excellent landlord as we can be here. Right. Other questions on? Well, if you know anybody on um, in town meeting members, I hope you will, you know, tell them how important it is to vote for this. These okay. two. Articles here. Great, thanks. Thank you very much. I'll call you. Okay. I wanted to meet with you. So yeah, I know that. We we'll would just no, let's no, just no. find a time. Okay. I think we can actually go out and get a cup of coffee these days. Sometime the next week. Okay. Are we? Did you have anything? You once said you wanted to ask something about moisture. Well, I just, you know, the moisture in these units. I want to just make sure that we should get his attention okay. here on that one. Here. Okay. Yeah, I will. I will. So I will. Uh, I'll be. Okay, we were just talking about the there's been moisture complaints in, in some of the units, and um, I just wanted to make so one thing I work in in environmental health and indoor air quality, mm -hmm. and and we've seen places where they've been trying to bump up the ventilation due to COVID and things, and so you can end up with moisture problems um, because your system isn't that <coughs> with cooling air and things. So I just didn't want to make sure there wasn't some ready fix other than there's I mean if there's leaks other things that can be repaired and yeah so being a little new to it I'm not sure what the leak situation is we are actually moving someone in the next week and we'll, mm -hmm. where there's a report of potential mold and we'll be cutting open walls and checking and, mm -hmm. and doing that um, and so we'll have a little bit better answer we do have a what I call a large mildew problem the exterior mm -hmm. mildew which is um, People believe what they see, and mm -hmm. it looks like there's mold. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a, a plan to um, that, that we're formulating. We have money available to do pressure washing, and, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of it has been. I think um, the plant life has been allowed to overgrow, and so sunlight hasn't cut through. The, and so, kind of looking at it that way as well. We don't like to go in and cut down a whole bunch of trees and shrubs, but the fact is they're overgrown in a lot of places, and it's caused, I think, added to the situation. So. Um, I don't have a full answer, but we are seriously looking. And, and I will say, we've told this to Tara and I'm sure Tim as well. You know, the board does know that we've been having a struggle lately. Um, and so we do get a regular report, you know, every month on how things are going or not going as the case may be. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really difficult. These, these buildings are not, you know, they're at the end of their useful lifetimes, like I said. I brought one more handout. I thought you folks might be interested. This is the uh, brand new town meeting uh, frequently asked questions document um, that we prepared. Even though she doesn't have a uh, plaque, Deja is also on the board. Yeah, yeah, so, okay. get one yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm too new to have Would you like, you can have one of these though, if you want. Well, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to take No, no, please. Take the paper. Well, the, the, I've, uh, this is not the first time I've been pitching this. Uh, for two years, I've been, you know, going to every board that I can get to here. So, but you're, you're welcome to have one of these there. So, uh, and uh, um, it just has a little bit more detail from a town meeting member. Why, why should I vote for this? You know, and, and I think it, you know, dovetails with what we went over tonight verbally here. Well, thank you so much for your time. Again. And uh, should we continue? Yeah. You have a tenth of years of town meeting. Oh, good. There you go. Good. Yeah. And let's let's uh, just email tomorrow and find a time that we can okay. get together. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay.
So, not, not, bad. Not, bad no, not bad at all. Um, all right, so uh, moving on, we have two items that we jumped over, uh, one of which I think we probably do a short discussion. So, after the uh, synthetic turf testing results. Sure, Tara, do you want to just give a brief update? Uh, this is just sort of follow up from the board's last questions from the last meeting. Sure. So, um, I had brought your inquiries back to Wendy from Fuss and O'Neill, and she submitted the follow-up email about recommending adding a field blank, which she could do instead of a trip or an equipment blank. So they recommend, that, and they can certainly add that for the next round of testing. They also recommended that you do testing during the dry time, um, since it's more conservative, and she recommended um, and doing another dry test, on, test on a dry day in September or October. They could, um, book that out for us. So we would, we would, you know, tweak our scope of work a little bit to include those. Um, but if that's something you're looking to do for the future testing, we could do that. And Steve, uh, I know it was a question that you had uh, specifically about runoff. Um, Tara, you spoke to Mike Retsky, who's the uh, division director for water and sewer for the town. And Yes, correct. And Mike Gretzky confirmed that all the drainage, that these fields have their own drainage systems and all the drainage water that flows off through the fields is um, basically they have that tied into the municipal stormwater drain system. So that's where that runoff water all gets directed towards. And where does that go? So that that's a municipal waste uh, Sorry, municipal stormwater drains that gets trickled out and in, in, into the the Does rivers. Is that going to Deer Island? Deer <laughs> Island. No, yeah. so that's different. It's different than the municipal wastewater uh, system. It's the stormwater system, the open drain system. That's why I'm asking. So where does that go? Still goes to Deer uh, Island. Yeah. yeah. Goes to Deer Island. Okay. So yeah. there's. The bigger concern was waste uh, groundwater, right? You were concerned Correct. about it was so it's not, all right. the ground. That, that is the concern. So I just want to make sure, I mean, if it's not going into our groundwater, then we're in no. good shape. Okay. Uh, because they set up the specific drainage to put it right into the stormwater system and to take it through the MWA pipes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay. you. Under the Charles River either. So. No, <laughs> no, it's no, not going no, to the Charles River. <laughs> that would be a problem. Um, We don't, we don't need to do anything with, um, unless the board wants it. I, we'll proceed with the board's direction on the additional testing uh, in September or October with the additional um, controls if the board okay. wanted. On the dry day. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, we have, we're running a little over time and we have a lot of staff reports to get through. Yeah. I thought we should probably jump to those. Great. Right now, so we have a lot of people on the call. And yes, not too much over time. Um, so we'll move to staff reports, and we'll start with emergency management. And Michael, Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'll try, I'll try and keep this uh, quick. So uh, last month, I was able to do a basic uh, shelter operations course uh, that was put on by uh, MEMA for emergency management directors uh, in Southeastern Massachusetts. Uh, and then uh, Talib's been working with the American Red Cross to uh, try and get a training for the Medical Reserve Corps volunteers on operating a shelter. Uh, we tried to get one for, for last weekend that had to be canceled because there weren't enough uh, volunteers. So we're still gonna be working with the Red Cross to try and get that up and running. But if the Red Cross can't be an option, MEMA can also uh, provide that, that shelter training to the MRC uh, so we can get everyone trained up and, and more familiar because it has been a while uh, since, uh, you know, before COVID since Needham's really focused on uh, emergency sheltering for storms or stuff like that. Um, 
Uh, and then the other big thing that I would hit on is that uh, last month we were able to finalize all the products for our hazard and vulnerability assessment. We were able to finalize our tool and our hazard list as well as our uh, rating scales. So uh, everything is good to go for that for the May 9th uh, local emergency planning committee meeting. Um, so uh, that's exciting that we'll be able to get that done because it has uh, been five years since we last had our, our uh, hazard and vulnerability assessment. Uh, are there any questions for me? I don't think so. Thank you, Michael. Great. Thank you. Uh, next report will be uh, emergency management support. Uh, Charlie. Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. He's not here. Um, but his month in March was um, what Michael said. Also, they were working on getting some MRC trainings put up. Um, we, Mary and I hosted CPR for about nine um, of our MRC and or staff volunteers from the region, not just Needham, um, from NC8. So he helped a lot with that, helped me with my drive through testing plan, um, which is finalized now, thankfully. And um, he's continuing an OSHA training, which is where he's at today. Substance use prevention. Here. Hello. Um, I'll keep mine brief as well in the interest of time. Um, the month of March um, found us busy uh, launching an event we had for our SPAN um, membership. We had uh, the former New Hampshire Supreme Court Chief Justice John Broderick present virtually to our community. Um, we were honored to have him. Uh, speak not only to his story around um, personal challenges, but uh, we particularly advertise this event as um, a way to share with people how the intersection of mental health and substance use can be um, a very debilitating situation when families are, are in the grips of that. And um, Judge Broderick did a great job for us in trying to provide people with um, steps for gaining awareness around identifying mental health, um, particularly in, in a family member. So our, our attendance on Zoom was, uh, we had about 28 people attend, which given the competition for many events during Zoom, we consider that a, a good success. Um, from a grant perspective, our STOP Act grant, uh, we had our heads down doing our, our first annual report um, which combined needing to learn a new system that uh, was introduced to us by our grant project officer earlier um, in the month. So we are pleased that we got that done. We also delivered WeCard calendars to all of our alcohol um, licensed establishments in the town of Needham. Those are day-to-day um, -day calendars that help people um, clarify what the minimum age is for purchasing alcohol, so for safe sales and service. And then other than that, we uh, did some mental health first aid training. We, um, we're we getting ready for the take back day on April 30th, and we're also, um, we worked on the new parent survey for 2022 that we are sending out to parents in grades with, with children in grades 6 through 12 as part of our data collection effort for substance use prevention. And uh, I'll keep it at that unless you have any other questions. The board might have questions about the compliance checks or we may want to at least True. talk quickly about that. So um, we, we kind of snuck this in here just to give you a, a heads up on this, um, wasn't part of our March report, but on April 6th, we worked with the Needham police to conduct our, uh, an alcohol compliance check. And we had at that time, five sales to minor violations, um, three of them from our carry out stores and two from restaurants. Um, if you scroll down just a little bit on this summary report, um, you'll see some takeaways here. So we had one business um, which unfortunately was a repeat from uh, our December compliance check. They failed both December and April. Um, and we had two businesses that had attended our tips training in January, but unfortunately 
had a sales to minor violation in April. And then uh, the good news is among the um, folks who had attended in January to our tips training, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven businesses passed. Um, so we like to think that hopefully that training was fresh in their minds and helped contribute to their uh, safe sales. So um, if you have any questions about that, I'll be happy to try to answer them. So what are people that have uh, raised new garden? I mean, I think this falls under the select board, right? Yes. Are they taking any action or is this, they're just ignoring it? Well, we always pass this information right along to the town manager's office. And I know that, you know, they obviously share that with the select board. I haven't heard any updates as of yet in terms of what the next steps are for um, businesses like Ray's New Garden. Are there more trainings? The yes. Trainings? Yes, we have our next training scheduled for June 13th. What about all the people that failed the April 6th? Will they have to do it again or the first time? Well, right technically. Now, they don't have to. I think one right. of the things we're trying to. Go ahead. They don't have to take our training. Um, they have to take a training. Uh, there is not a. I think the hope would be that we could start saying, you know, if you failed, then you have to take these specific steps. Mm -hmm. um, the select board has been getting more serious about compliance. And I know that they brought everyone who failed in December in for hearings. Um, I expect they'll do the same in April. Um, in December, they gave, depending on if it was a first violation, if it was a, a second violation, or if it was uh, in one instance, they gave warnings. Most of the time, they gave a, a written warning for a first violation. For a second violation, they gave a day suspension. Um, and for one or two cases where there there was some issue with the, the layout of an out-of-state license that looked like it would have been a, it would have said that the person was the age in Massachusetts, they gave a written a verbal warning rather than a written warning. So I, I we can follow up and try to figure out what the next steps are, but. We haven't heard yet. It'd be interesting to follow Ray's new garden because the word's been around for a while that that's an easy place to go get a drink. Yes. So. You also didn't see the, the pictures of the um, young people who went in. It looked like a, like, a <laughs> Do we have a previous inspection three months before December? When did we do like December 2021? That was before that. Do we know? Um, I believe within, within a, what happened. Like I believe our our um, one prior to December 2021 was in 2019. Carol, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. It was before the pandemic. That's fine. For Karen. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Moving on to Julie with uh, epidemiology and COVID. It doesn't matter. It just was a separate section of the, the thing originally. So I don't know. Uh, Julie is also not here, so I will be uh, running through hers as well. Um, so Julie's been busy. We've been putting her to work uh, <laughs> with lots of new projects. So she's been helping uh, revamp our our website because uh, it's not user friendly or intuitive so she is working on that um, with the PIO who runs the town website as well to make sure that it kind of makes more sense makes more user friendly um, the reason she's not here now is because she's also working on GIS systems and learning how to use ArcGIS so that then we can more accurately track data um, and pinpoint it more closely to need them specific areas um, and go back years to kind of look and see trends and um, work through all of that. Um, and then she's also working with one of our contact tracers who's been with us since January, I think, of 2021 um, to um, go back through all the Metro West Adolescent Health Survey data and look at additional <coughs> Metro data or local towns um, to find information and see trends on that as well. So we have a better source of since we've been doing that 
those surveys, what that kind of looks like and what that means for Needham and the differences. Um, she continues to do an awesome job with all her COVID updates and everything like that as well. So I'll quickly run through that. Um, as you can see, everyone's increasing, um, has been increasing for the last two periods, at least um, within Massachusetts. Needham is at a higher rate. Um, unsure why Needham and Wellesley seem to have higher increases and percent positivities than the other surrounding towns. Um, she just believes there's a lot of factors that she can't actually make a current draw, draw any conclusions from because of the changes with home tests and everything like that. So you see the Needham daily cases. Um, we kind of seem to be in a little bit of a downtrend on a daily basis. So hopefully that maintains. March cases, you can see it were 184 with the highest case rate within the 40 to 49 year olds, um, but the 20 year olds and the 50 year olds in close running. And if you go to April through the 18th, uh, we surpassed March um, by quite a bit. But again, we still also have the 40 to 49 year olds uh, leading the way. Um, but the interesting piece is the zero to four year olds that crept up and have been creeping up in April. Um, she wrote me notes. Let me just switch my page here. Um, any, any uh, evidence of an increase after spring break, or is it too early to tell? At that current moment, because it's the first week, it's too early to tell. We won't have the full data for the first week until Saturday. Uh, the state won't put any out till next Thursday. Yeah. So um, we could pull our raw numbers, but we won't know full week until at least at the end of Saturday. Hold up 78 cases for the last week. I thought that closed the vacation week. Um, case by vaccination status. Um, so a couple of things on this, I'll just scroll down to the next one of the booster rates is really the state has come out and said at this time, we're not going to differentiate or can't differentiate between second boosters and regular boosters. Um, Cause you just don't know there's so many factors. Some people can get four, some people can get three. And it's not an easy way to break it down at the 50 year old rate and see who's there, especially since it's not required. And the state system currently does not say booster one, booster two, it just says vaccinations. And so it'll show four. So we can't fully say if it's like a second booster or if they were you know, immunocompromised, so they had to get an extra dose or that kind of thing. So we don't have that ability to make that determination. Um, with a lot of the unvaccinated cases we had for April, especially, but it looks like March had quite a few as well. We're not sure that the two systems are talking either. And the rate was so high for the last two months that she wasn't able to go back and look and actually manually check each case to see where their boosters lie. So, um, so we just don't think the systems are talking. So you go down to the state um, information, you get the new Omicron sub lineage. I mean, BA 2.12.1, um, they said on state call on Tuesday that they are assuming that this is a lot more of the cases um, within Massachusetts as well. So we're just looking at different things again, maybe more um, ability to catch it, but not nearly as virulent as long as you're vaccinated and those kind of things. So, um, so that's, that's good to a point. <laughs> Um, if you look to the MA new confirmed cases by age, she splits them down. Um, she has dropped off splitting it from a year ago. I don't know if you paid attention to the previous ones, but she used to compare current cases with a year ago um, and just didn't feel that that was correct or appropriate with the changes in vaccination rates and different things that have come along. So now she's comparing it to the previous reporting period and the previous month to kind of compare. So the MWR wastewater monitoring is showing a decline at this current moment in time. We take that as a good sign. We hope that it continues to go down. Um, it's usually a, you know, a two-ish week lag to start seeing our case rate go down as well. Or at least that's been the trend. So let's hope we see that um, as well because we got our data for today and we are up at to a 6.2% positivity rate mm -hmm. this week. Um, hospitalizations, again, she will continue to compare this to one year ago at this current moment in time. That may change um, based off of as the data and the state puts it out there. 
Um, total COVID patients in the hospital, you got your total, total there. A uh, good thing to note is the percentage of primary COVID vaccination, or sorry, primary COVID uh, diagnoses are only 29% of the cases. Um, the rest were incidental or found while in the hospital for another reason. So, uh, so that is a good sign. Uh -huh. I went through that fast. Any questions? Um, I don't have any questions by the board members. No, we're fine. So things are continuing to trend down with the wastewater issues. Yes, that's what we're saying. All right, thank you, Tiffany. <laughs> yeah. um, now, Mary with uh, Public Health Nursing. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, took me a second to get unmuted there. Um, so yes, Hannah and I uh, continued on for the month of March. As you can see, there was an uptick in COVID cases. Um, mask policies changed in public schools on the 7th of March, which caused a lot of people a lot of confusion that we've been helping to work through as per a previous conversation that I had with you guys at one of our previous meetings. Um, we are starting to see a slight uptick in latent tuberculosis infection. Um, we haven't had anybody contagious. I don't want to start a panic, but um, we did have, the state had 12,000 cases of latent TB um, in 2020, and that's just something that happens, and that's something that we're going to have to track a little bit more. Um, Hana had a training for au pairs on household poison control. She started a matter of balance class. And um, we already did the COVID report. Not a whole lot else in regards to infectious disease to report, but I've got, um, I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has one. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mary. And uh, we will move on to Rebecca. Welcome. I guess this is your first meeting you with us also. It and is. Traveling with. <laughs> okay. Um, so in March, yeah, March, uh, we delivered 918 meals to 46 consumers. 38 of those are Springwell consumers um, and eight of those are private pay consumers. Uh, we brought on two new clients. One is a Springwell client and one is a private client. Um, you can't really see the numbers on the graph, but the the 2000, uh, the 2022 number is 918. On um, the 2000, 2021 number is 899. So it was a 2% increase year over year. Um, there are no 911 calls in March. So that was a win. <laughs> Yay. And we delivered meals with our wonderful crew of 28 volunteers. Um, we're still not packaging meals um, with our volunteers. The hospital is still doing that for us. Uh, they have reached out to me this week to see if it's something we could possibly take back on. Um, I'm assuming it's based on them not having staffing needs for it. So I'm meeting with them on Friday to go over that with them. So any, I'll take any questions. Do you think you have the staff to handle the, the packaging? Um, Marianne left me a list of volunteers that had done the packaging in the past. So once I meet with um, Dan at uh, Beth Israel, I'm going to reach out to them and see if anybody is still available to do it. Granted, our summer program is starting up on June 20th, so it would be a very short term um, amount of time I would need them for but I would need to 
if we are going to implement it again, I, I need to think about it and make sure we have them in place for the fall. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Thanks. And we'll move on to accreditation. Uh, Lynn, Chip. Just a really quick summary that um, we have a team now. Um, Cindy Melanson and Jessica Kent joined. They're both working part time. And um, I was gifted um, some time from other people as well. There are a couple of people from the Shared Services Grant who will be doing some work on accredit uh, accreditation as well. So we're getting organized, um, already making progress. Today we met with um, folks from Aging Services and Community Council um, and BID to start talking about the next, the next focus of the senior survey, which we hope to administer in June. Um, we're interested in moving away from what we had to focus on last time, the transportation and housing, and moving more towards the, um, the psychosocial effects of COVID in terms of isolation and food insecurity and those kinds of things. So that's what we're looking at focusing on next time, this time. I would love your input on this if anybody cares to. routine on those surveys to ask uh, demographic questions around uh, race, ethnicity, et cetera? Um, we did not ask about race, race and ethnicity last time. You know, it, what's interesting is that last time also we asked for gender and only gave two choices. And here we are six years later, understanding that we have to give more choices. So there are a couple of questions that we have to re redesign. Um, as far as the race and ethnicity question, um, it's so complicated and so big and we have such limited space. And yet being a member of the racial equity committee, it's something I really care about. So it's something to struggle with. Um, Again, I would love your input on it. And I'd be happy to talk to you offline. You know, where I work, we've spent hours and hours of time designing surveys that we do in healthcare that ask race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, all those kinds of things that, you know, are based on literature and best practice. So I'd hate for you to have to rework, re redo oh. that kind of- Oh, no, no, we're working, with, we're working with people who know this stuff. We have a wonderful consultant here we've worked with, but your perspective would be terrific. Thank you. Well, I just think it's important that we make sure we include those, those questions. I think we all, we see important differences when we do that, so. Yeah. Language would be another one as well. Yes. It's, uh... Questions for me. All right, thank you very much. Environmental health. Okay. Um, I'll start off. Um, as we already have heard, Ali had joined our team as a full time health agent on April 4th. We're really excited uh, that she's taken on that position. And then we also have some um, news about uh, Talia, who has started a part time position as a part time health agent on April 19th. So she'll be working on Fridays and over the weekends for an extra 10 hours a week. So we, we have a good team now in place and we're excited that we can keep doing our good work. Um, the other update I wanted to give is the urgent hoarding house, um, housing cases. Uh, just quick updates on those two. Um, the one that we were working on um, with Wingate, uh, the current status is that that occupant had has vacated the unit and Wingate is now working with a professional cleaning company to completely clean and disinfect that unit and they are keeping us in the loop giving us updates on that and how that's progressing um, they'll let us know when they're ready to have a follow-up inspection 
by us. So that will be coming in the next uh, few weeks. And then the other um, more recent um, housing case on Gage Street, we're also um, uh, closely with Jess Moss from CAF um, and also Carol and Needham Police on making sure that resident has the proper uh, resources. Um, and so we'll be connecting uh, on a weekly basis with uh, that um, with Jess as being the main person that she's coordinating that with the resident. So we feel that these are in a good place and we'll continue to monitor them as we go forward. I don't know if Allie wanna give a couple of updates. Sure, uh, so two more updates. Uh, we applied for an intern with the National Environmental Health Association, um, hoping that we could um, use them for our nutritionally need them eating campaign that we're trying to do annually. We haven't heard back yet. Um, so hopefully that works out. And then we have started uh, permitting for the seasonal Needham farmers market. It's actually going to be taking place at Greensfield this year, not in front of the town hall. And um, we're seeing a lot of interest in uh, people wanting to sample. So we wanted to kind of seek the Board of Health's um, feelings on that. We know we've ceased sampling since COVID. Um, so we wanted just to bring that up and get your opinion and approval if that would be okay to start sampling again at the farmer's market, obviously um, with proper food safety and all of that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, I think that would be reasonable with the usual food preparation standards to, to resume that. I think, I think it's reasonable at this time. Yeah. With the caveat, assuming things Thanks, are really quick. What's really good is that they do have hand washing now at this location, so that makes it a lot better than the previous location. Oh, yeah, right. Was, so, does that mean they could? Oh, we don't have bathrooms, so can't do prepared food, can't sell a sandwich, right? So, that was the issue. Did they, did the farmers market get a, a signed agreement with bathroom access? Um, so, they, uh, the YMCA is going to be open. Um, so they plan on leaving that open um, and having them using the facilities, the bathroom and the hand washing sink in there. So oh, that's can, where it is. Does okay. the farmer's market realize that that shift? Like that that means people. Ellie, can you? I don't know if you could sold. hear Sorry, Kathleen's question um, about uh, prepared foods, like a, a sandwich being sold at the farmer's market. Right. We could never do that before. Yeah, so uh, no hot holding um, will be there. Um, no, everything needs to be pre-made before they bring it to the farmer's market. They can't right, but, cook on site. Sure, but would allow, for example, a vendor to sell pre-made sandwiches or something like that? Yes. Again, assuming they're all wrapped and everything else before they put them in. Pre-made sandwiches that come yes. wrapped, right? Yeah. So no hot food, but you could make a cold, I don't, I don't care what well, they do. I just meant the pastries are there, and I don't think they're wrapped. Yeah, they're not wrapped. Yeah, I don't yeah. think they're pre-wrapped, right? It's just me they make them in a box or something that you open. Right. Yeah. I think Kathleen's responding to comments and requests in the past that people wanted uh, vendors to be able to sell food like that. And one of the challenges we had was um, limited or no running fire for sanitation and no bathroom access. So the food code limited our options, but it sounds like with the Greensfield location, we have more flexibility. Is that, that's right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, you know, when they apply, we obviously have to approve all their processes, make sure they have proper cold holding and all of that as well. Sure. And that's a guarantee that the Y will be open and it won't be someday the farmer's market will be there and the Y will be closed. Yeah, the Y, the y is committed to that. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, questions on environmental health? 
So just um, maybe as a follow-up or continuation of our earlier issue, this foodborne illness risk violation chart, um, what we would do is for violations that meet either the uh, core or uh, priority or priority core violations, um, we would include the charts as we normally do, but would also append the full inspection report from that. And so as part of the environmental policy that we're going to develop for the board, we'll, we'll figure out what the right threshold is for minor violations versus major violations. Um, you know, and maybe it'll be a case of we would include it if the restaurant doesn't show documentation that they've corrected it within five days or three days or something. Um, but we would start including more direct full inspection reports in the board packet. Diana for the shared services grant. Yep, I'll try to be quick. Um, so the shared services grant, we were granted two grants from the state, one for contact tracing that's been supporting two contact tracers that are helping Dover and Medfield um, with cases. And then we have the public health excellence grant. So I started the position on February 28th and I also was able to hire a part-time environmental health agent named Roland. Uh, basically, the focus of March was just getting Roland trained as an environmental health agent. So he uh, went out to do his CPO, which is the Certified Pool and Spot Operator course, and uh, the Serve Save Food Manager training. Um, I've been working just to try to figure out the best way to roll out the program with the two other towns. So basically, the, the idea of the shared public health services grant is to be sharing our environmental health services in Needham with Dover and Medfield because Dover and Medfield, their structures are nothing like Needham. Dover, I don't even think has any full-time staff at all. Medfield has one person, a public health nurse. So we're trying to use all the resources that we have in Needham and with this funding from the state to, you know, improve environmental health between the three towns. I've been meeting with um, Board of Health members, town administrators, and just trying to figure out what the needs are in the other towns to see how we can support them. Um, and then I have a side project that I've been working with Kathleen on the Purple Air Sensor Project. So we, I think I discussed this a couple months back that uh, the Department of Environmental Protection awarded Needham with 10 purple air sensors. Um, so those sensors detect PM 2.5 in the air. I've been working with Kathleen, just trying to figure out different locations in town where it makes sense to set up those sensors. Um, if anybody has any specific questions, I know we're pretty over on time, but just feel free to ask. Uh, not hearing any questions. Uh, thank you, Diana. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of the reports. I think we should, I don't like to do it again, but I think we should probably move into the agenda plans for the next meeting. I uh, think it would make sense to discuss the public in detail when we're all over time. So let's do, let's do that and move it. And then we have our next board meeting scheduled now for May 24th, 6 to 8. Yes. And June is still TBD. Uh, I think we may have lost Steve or he may temporarily uh, fall off. He did, it seemed like um, that I had to ask you some of your availability for June, but Steve didn't seem like he had any, either any availability that week or maybe his easy schedule had to be set. Week in June. Uh, it was the third week of June. Because I'm going to be on a trip from June 6th through potentially the 20th. Okay. Cool. Uh, uh, so we'll go back out, but we at least have a May date. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'd like to potentially suggest to the board is um, considering you know, it's May meeting, um, whether it wants to go back to a set date and time. Um, the board used to meet 
uh, the second Friday of the month at 7 a.m. Uh, I don't know if any of the staff loved getting up that early, especially in winter, but it was sort of a consistent meeting schedule. Um, and I think it, it helps guarantee better attendance maybe. Um, the select board also has some policies that we might want to consider, including having an open sort of public comment period at the beginning of, of a meeting. Uh, not if there's a public hearing, but if someone wants to make a comment on any subject, uh, they could email ahead of time and you know, 10 minutes could be afforded at the beginning of meeting. Um, it, I'll prevent, uh, present more information about it, but it's something to sort of consider. Um, the board will have to reorganize, not at this meeting, which historically it has reorganized in April, but at its May meeting. Um, my own sort of error in the challenges of scheduling, the town charter says that because the chair of the Board of Health is a de facto member of town meeting uh, in their role as chair, you can't reorganize within 10 days of town meetings beginning. Um, so we would have had to meet um, between the day of the election and we didn't get we didn't get in that window between when the Teja was elected and there was the full board members versus mm -hmm. when that date is. So we'll have to reorganize in May. Okay. Two brief announcements I had. Okay. Um, so I think with that, um, my business is finished for tonight. So do. Um, any other issues people want to bring up? I don't think so. All right, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.